sacred symbols, which is essentially how human beings try to describe, understand, explain, symbolize sacred things. Now, we do this in all sorts of ways. Humans, we tend to have speech as our major form of communication, but in fact, humans can communicate through action, through body language, through ritual, through art, all sorts of different things. So as we do that, uh, we create a, a number of different systems of symbols by which we try to communicate things. Just as human language is, you know, there's many different languages, essentially all I'm doing is making a bunch of strange sounds, but you guys understand what I'm saying, hopefully, because we, we've created a social norm of what a particular sound means, right? I mean, when my little uh, one and a half year old granddaughter, she kind of talks a little bit, but it's just babbling. I mean, she just says strange sounds. She's trying to imitate, she's learning how to do this. They are applying a symbolic significance to an abstract sound. So that's what we do with language, but we also do it with lots of other things. So this creates a whole set of different ways we can symbolize and try to communicate ideas about divine things. So that's kind of the theme of the course. Now, now first we have to look at the, uh, the concept of sacred. What, is it, what does it mean to be sacred? And the, it's essentially a different way to say holy. Um, in English is a language based on both Latin roots uh, and also uh, Germanic roots. And so we tend to have two different words for the same thing a lot of times, uh, of which holy is a Germanic root and sacred is a Latin root. So they're kind of the same thing. In the Bible, it's Kadosh. And what we're going to do as we look through these sacred symbols is look at biblical examples. Now, we could do examples from lots of different cultures, but because the, the Bible is more familiar to you than, say, the Quran, we're going to use biblical examples. Now, in the Bible, it describes things as holy. It says this is holy, that's holy, the other thing's holy. And these are the types of things it describes. It describes the spoken word as holy. So, you know, these are holy words, holy things you say. Or texts, like the Holy Bible, right? Or ritual. There's, there are acts that they do in the temple of a sacrifice or something that is described as holy. And then also objects. So there, there are, for example, vessels and the menorah. These things are holy to the Lord. All right? Art, images can be holy. Architecture, the temple is called holy, right? A building. There's holy time. The Sabbath day is holy. So notice, lots of different things can be holy. What does it mean to be holy? Sacred, but it means that which belongs to God. That which is God's is holy. That, that's really what it means in, in its Old Testament context. So anything that's associated with God, anything that belongs to God, so the priests are holy to the Lord, right? They're holy. They're his. They belong to him. So, so that's the essence of this idea. Now, temples seem to be uh, are holy places, but they're also holy institutions. That is, that it is a community of people that operate together to try to create holiness so that God can rest there. And, and uh, so temple then is often a building, but it's also often a, a simply a... Uh, a group of people or an institution or a community that can be holy. And the purpose of this holiness, of creating this holiness, is so that you have a place where God can dwell. Okay, Bukowski's got the syllabi. Raise your hand if you need a syllabus, okay? Uh, keep your hand up till you get one so that he can kind of follow along. Now, practically speaking, in a functional sense, temples are places that create, preserve, and transmit sacred symbols. So we have this set of sacred or holy things and ideas and symbols and a temple creates those and then transmits them and preserves them for the community. Okay? That's kind of what it's doing. Now, in, in describing how, or try to understand how the temple is described in the Old Testament, we need to think about all the different ways that it's described and all the different things it's described as doing. Does everybody have a syllabus? Raise your hand. Okay, everybody's got one. Thanks. Okay, temple, uh, the number one thing about the temple is it's the dwelling place of God. It's holy because it's where God dwells. And, and in that sense, what we're saying is 
It's the house of the Lord, right? House of the Lord means God's house. It's a place he lives, a place, place he dwells. Now, if you look at the, uh, the Bible carefully, it is described as having a dwelling place for God in heaven. So there is a temple in heaven where God dwells, but also one on earth. And the, the heavenly temple is the real temple. It's the eternal temple. The earthly temple is an imitation of that. It's kind of a summer home where God can come and stay for a while, but his real dwelling is in, is in heaven. Where do we find the temple in heaven described in, in the Bible? The book of Revelation and the book of Hebrews are the two main places. They talk about you know, the spiritual temple or the heavenly temple. Okay? The book of Revelation takes place entirely in the courtyard of the heavenly temple, where John goes there and he, he sees God, he sees the angelic priests, and then they, you know, they're watching what's happening on earth, but, but the scene is John is in the heavenly temple. It begins, you know, the heavens open and behold the temple. I mean, he, he sees the temple in heaven. Okay. The temple is also described as the residence of angels. Angels are intimately associated with temples. And in the earthly temple, the human priests uh, perform the function of angels. That is to say, in the heavenly temple, the angels are the priests of God. On the earthly temple, the human priests are the priests of God. And they do on earth what the angels do in heaven. They're described as surrounding the throne of God. The throne of God is in the temple, right? If you look at the Old Testament accounts of the temple, uh, he's got a throne in there. The throne room is the Holy of Holies, all right? There's, there's creatures called cherubim, and, and, or cherubs. Cherubim is the uh, Hebrew plural. Cherub is single. But uh, these are guardians. You always see them doing a function of guarding something. These are the guardians of God. They guard the throne of God. They guard, guard the gates that go in to the temple. And they're always associated with the temple, except in one place, uh, the temple or the throne of God, except uh, in the Garden of Eden where they are described as guarding the entryway into the Garden of Eden. What does that tell us about the Garden of Eden? It's a, it's a surrogate temple. The, the temples always had gardens around them. They had, you know, plants and trees and stuff growing in the courtyards and around the temple. Uh, seraphim is another term used for these creatures. The, these are more like descriptions rather than categories of creatures, although later on... Uh, you know, uh, Christian theology assigns all sorts of ranks and hierarchies. Seraphim means the shiny ones, the brilliant flashing ones. They're, they're really bright and shiny. And, and cherubim probably is, is a guardian. So, so they are a function rather than the name of a class of, of uh, angels. Uh, and these angels, as I said, fill the same role in the heavenly temple that the priests fill in the earthly temple. And I'm giving you here on these slides uh, biblical references to these ideas uh, but I could go through and find similar types of ideas in, in the Quran or in the Hindu scriptures and so forth because it's interesting that many of these idea, ideas are universal. It's not to say they're exactly the same, but the basic sense of a guardian figure is very widespread. You know, some, some guardian being that guards the throne or guards the entry to the temple. Okay, the temple is the site of creation. There's two ways to understand this. Number one is that wherever God first appears and starts creation, that's a holy spot because God uh, was there, and so it, it becomes holy through God's presence, and therefore they build a temple there to commemorate that. Uh, and so when we, when we read about Solomon's temple, uh, there is a rock that was probably the place of the Holy of Holies. We'll talk about this later on. It's, it's the rock of the Dome of the Rock. The dome is over this rock that was the ancient Hebrew site. And it was, it's called by the rabbis the Eben Shatia, which means the stone of foundation or the foundation stone, because that's the first place creation started. That's where God went and kind of started this creation phenomenon. And the Solomon's Temple took seven years to build, it says explicitly, and that's because that was intended building schedule to match the seven days of creation, right? So, so you have uh, symbol, symbolism of temples as places of creation. And the first thing the gods do when they make the universe, after they've made the universe, the first thing they do is uh, build a temple. Is that what God does in Genesis? Well, they don't call it a temple, but it is a garden that is God's garden. It's a garden where God dwells. So, so it's a temple garden, right? And, and as we'll see, the Garden of Eden is a temple symbol in, in a little bit later. It's the center of the universe. This is an important thing to understand if you're going to get what's going on here, and that is 
ancient peoples measured time and space from the temple, not from any absolute. They were kind of Einsteinian relativists before uh, we are. Modern, uh, w when we look, when we think about the earth in modern terms, we think of the earth as a object and we think of north and south based on you know, what direction the planet is and what our maps are. And when we talk about going up, we mean going north and things like that, right? It's all based on this preconception of how we print our maps. In point of fact, there is no up or down to Earth, right? There's no north isn't up, south isn't down. It's, it's completely abstracted of what we try to do with this. Isn't that right? Now, the ancient people, in order to measure things, had to have a point of reference to start measuring. And that point of reference was the temple. It's the geographical center of the Earth from which you measure north, south, east, and west. So. To the Egyptians, Israel was north. To the Israelites, Egypt was south. And if you read an Egyptian text, you've got to understand when they say north and south, they mean something different than the Israelites did, and that means something different than the Greeks did. You've got to take each culture and their geographical measuring terms based on that culture itself rather than any absolute. So when the ten tribes go to the land northward, it doesn't mean the North Pole. It means they go to something that's north of Jerusalem. That might be Syria, that might even be Iraq. Those are north of Jerusalem. Doesn't mean necessarily Siberia or the Arctic Circle. Does that make sense? Now, to understand an example of this is the old saying, all roads lead to Rome. That's because Rome is the sacred center of the Roman culture, and all roads lead there because that's the center of the universe. Everything's going to lead to Rome. It's not, you know, in a sense, it reflects Rome's power and dominance, but it also reflects Rome's sacredness. This helps us then to understand the Book of Mormon, I think, because you know we talk about land northward and land southward and stuff, and people have tried to correlate this with the, the hemisphere. North America is, is the land northward and things like that. Whether that's the case or not, land northward and land southward can only be measured if we know what the center place was, which was probably Zarahemla. So land northward and land southward is not an absolute based on modern maps. The Nephites didn't have any modern maps of the continent, right? It is land north of Zarahemla, land south of Zarahemla. That's how you would define it, okay? Or maybe bountiful. So the only way to make sense out of the Book of Mormon geography is to understand that ancient concept. And then, then it actually makes perfect sense. Everything fits as long as you understand that. Now, it's also the place where heaven and earth meets. Not just the center of the universe, but the center of the cosmos. Because it's kind of like having a, uh, a, a sphere of which there's a, there's a flat plane on it, and the, the dot in the center of the sphere would be the center of the flat plane, uh, you know, a disk in the sphere, but it would also be the center of the sphere as a whole, right? So it's a center of, can be the center of multiple places. Uh, the the uh, a ter term in Akkadian is Babylon, which means the gate of the gods in Akkadian, but it gets transliterated into English as Babylon. Babylon was the gate of the gods. That's what it meant in the old language. Okay? So it's the gate of the gods because that's the gateway through which the gods can come in and out of earth. You always pray to the sacred center. This is a very ancient practice. The Jews pray to Jerusalem. The Muslims pray, pray to Mecca. You face the center place, the place where God dwells, when you pray. You're facing God. Another ritual, so prayer towards the center place. Another ritual is circumambulation, which is walking around something as a ritual act. This is described, there's a book called the Jewish Temple, which we have, don't have for this course, but it's got a, uh, some pages where it describes Jewish rituals of circumambulation of the altar in the temple. So this means essentially to circumambulate means to walk around something, but it refers to the ritual of either facing a sacred center place to pray or walking around that sacred center place as a ritual act. Okay? But all of those things show you that the center was the temple there. Now, time is also measured from the temple. That is to say, from ancient perspective, time is the measurement of the movement of the heavens. Now, from our modern astrophysics perspective, the movement of the heavens is an optical illusion, right? It's really not moving, the earth is spinning. But, uh, from the ancient perspective, they always describe the heavens as moving, and they move in a sphere, spherical motion around the earth. 
if you go out and stay out all night and watch the stars, they spin in a circular uh, fashion around the North Pole, right? That, that's what you'd physically see. And you can see this with slow motion, stop motion photography that you know, takes 1,000 photographs throughout the night, and you can literally see the spherical movement of the, or, uh, circular movement of the stars. So time is measured, and you observe it from the temple. It, it, therefore, you set the calendar based on the ast astronomical phenomenon that you observe from the temple. The book of Genesis says explicitly that the sun, the moon, and the stars are set there for signs and seasons. The purpose that, well, that, the purpose that they have is to help us measure time, right? And, and we measure time so that we correlate earthly behavior with heavenly behavior as reflected in the stars. So we know when it's Sabbath, when it's the new moon, when it's you know, this ritual or this festival or whatever. This also involves often facing, well, go ahead. What's your question? Um, so like when they say in the Book of Mormon an hour according to their reckoning, could that be a lot different than our time? Yeah. I mean, it all depends on what the center point is that you're measuring from, right? Yeah. So what would that mean exactly? I don't know what the center point is that they're talking You know, I mean, you'd have to go to Colab or something to figure that out. But I, I try to hide a Colab every now and then, but I've never made it yet. So. Uh, so you figure out your calendar, festival of calendars from this sacred center. There's a lot of orientation towards the east because of the rising sun. We tend to, to think of, you know, north as kind of the, the main thing uh, as you organize uh, maps and so forth. North is up. But anciently, east was up. That is, say you'd faced east. Orientation means facing the orient or the east. So you face east and then... South is right, north is left, and west is back. And, and you see this in the Hebrew writing. When they say Kedem, it means the east, but also the place of the rising sun. So orientation is also done to the east rather than to the north. And uh, lots of temples have astronomical art in them. Stars painted on the ceiling or things reflecting all sorts of different uh, so, uh, solar and, and lunar and stellar uh, symbols. So, so the temple is kind of a heavenly place. It's also associated with a mountain. And basically what you've got here is an elevated space that's closer to heaven than normal space. And that on the top of that is the temple. Now in practical terms, uh, we talk about uh, the house of the Lord being on the Har Yahweh, which means the mountain of the Lord. You know, let's go up to the mountain of the Lord. If you've been to Jerusalem, the temple is not on a mountain. It's a, it's a punky little hill, right? I mean, it's not a big high mountain. It's, you know, 40, 50 feet around the surrounding places. But it is a symbolic mountain, right? It, it is the mountain of the Lord because symbolically this temple is a mountainous place. It is at the center of creation, this mountain is. And in fact, the mountain is... Garden of Eden is described as being on a mountain. It's, it's God's mountain. There's another mountain that's God's mountain that is Sinai, and there's another one that is Zion. These are described in a text called Jubilees. It's a pseudepigraphic te Jewish text, 426 here. Why do I say Eden is on a mountain? If you read the Garden of Eden story in Genesis, is it on a mountain? Does anything say, you know, this is the garden on a mountain? No. So why do I think it's on a mountain? Well, number one, yeah, go ahead. Yes, there's four rivers flow out of Eden and they flow in the four directions and, and water flows downhill so it's got to be elevated in some way, right? That, that's, that's a clue, but it's not explicit. But the explicit thing is in Ezekiel 28, 11 to 19, which explicitly says it's describing the garden of God, the mountain, you know, Eden and so forth. And it, and it explicitly says it's a mountain. So that, although it's not explicit in Genesis, it's explicit in Ezekiel. And also in Psalms here, 48, 1 to 4, it talks about God dwelling on a mountain. So, so the association of mountains with God's dwelling place is universal in ancient societies. Is that true of the Greeks? Where do they dwell? Mount Olympus. In, in the Hindu tradition, it's Mount Meru. So, you know, these cosmic mountains, we call them. It's also a place associated with waters. Now, we've got to understand that ancient societies categorized and conceptualized things differently than do modern societies. 
For example, the ancients talked about four elements, earth, air, fire, and water. Those are the four elements. Now, in fact, in modern terms, we would call those four states of matter, right? Which would be energy, gaseous, liquid, and solid. So, so when the ancients talk about water, they, they don't mean necessarily water as we understand it, but anything in, in a liquid state. And, and waters then, the association of waters with the temple occur in all sorts of different ways. First of all, there's the idea of the abyss, which are the waters of chaos or primordial water or matter. And if you read the creation stories that we, we talked about, we'll get to them probably in a little bit. If you look at those creation stories, the... Um, they all talk about water as part of the creation, right? How does, what, what's the description in Genesis? In the, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form, void, meaning kind of desolate wasteland, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Okay, that's a formless, dark, desolate liquid, deep. The deep is tehom, and it means uh, abyss or primordial liquid, okay? So there's waters of creation. Creation narratives talk about waters. And we would call it matter unorganized or primordial matter. All right? So that's the idea of the deep or the tehom. The waters of life also flow from the temple. These are three passages here, Ezekiel, Revelations, uh, and, uh, which talk about waters flowing from the temple that, that water the whole world. And then there's also the four rivers of Eden, the Gihon, being one of those which water the world. Notice, what do they call the main spring of Jerusalem, which is right at the base of the Temple Mount? It's the Gihon Spring. They named it after one of the four waters of Eden. So the temple's there, and there's a spring flowing out from the temple, and they name it after the, one of the four rivers of paradise. Okay? So, there is water, there's basically three senses that water is used. Water of creation, this, this primordial mass or liquid. There is water of Life, which flows from the temple and gives life to the world, right? Especially in arid zones, water is life. And then thirdly, there's waters of purification, which we haven't talked about yet, but water is also a symbol of purification because you wash dirt and blood and whatever off with water. Okay? Somebody had a hand up? I thought I saw a hand. Now, remember... Uh, Creation is in a garden, the temple is in a garden, and in this garden there is a tree of life. Now the tree of life is reflected in biblical tradition with the trees carved on the temple walls and columns which symbolize trees. If you look at the description of the temple, it has, they said there's date palm trees or something on it. The menorah is carved with almond leaves and, and almonds. That's an almond tree, right? The, the five branches of the menorah is a symbolic tree. And then there are, the columns are made out of trees. Now, sometimes they, they turn, turned them into stone, but originally the columns were all made out of wood. Uh, and so you had literally trees in your, in your temples. The, the uh, Bible also talks about a thing that's called groves in the King James Version. This is a mistranslation. Uh, in the 16th century, or, or <clears throat> early 17th century when the King James Version was first translated, uh, they didn't have a lot of archaeological data or linguistic data that we have now. And so they misunderstood uh, things on occasion, and this is one of them. Uh, the, the term in grove is asherah in Hebrew, and they knew it was something kind of associated with trees and wood, so they, they translated it as groves. But generally, this Asherah is a tree of life symbol that is associated with a Canaanite goddess who is called Asherah. We now know her name from other texts that have been discovered in the past uh, century or so. So we know this ancient goddess existed and associated with trees and its tree of life symbolism, probably. And the Menorah is a, is a tree of life symbol and the temple is associated with the Garden of Eden. So you have lots of tree symbols here. Why a why a tree as a tree of life? Why is that a symbol of eternal life? Well, number one, you can eat fruit of the tree and that fruit sustains you. Trees live really long. They live longer than humans, so they seem to be, you know, eternal or long living. But there's another key ingredient to this, and that is that uh, almost everything humans eat we have to kill to, to, to get that food. That is, we have to kill something to live. 
right? You kill the plants, you kill the animals, you chop down the grain to get it, you eat the seeds. I mean, we have to kill to live. There's a few exceptions to that. What are some exceptions to the fundamental principle that you have to kill something else in order to live? You can't eat rocks. You have to eat something that's living to transfer that life to you to sustain your own life. What's the exceptions? Fruit, right? You pick a fruit off a tree, the tree doesn't die. You take the grain off the, you know, a, a piece of wheat, that, that you kill it. You've got to kill it to get the grain off. But you can take the fruit off and the tree lives and then it produces more fruit. So you can eat fruit without killing something. It, it is life from life that doesn't kill. The other interesting things are honey and milk, right? So you don't kill the goat when you take the milk. You don't, I guess you kill the bees, but, you know, honey at any rate, you know, it's, it's something that's just kind of miraculously uh, food. And so a land flowing in with milk and honey is this paradisical land, right? And, and the tree of life then is there because you don't kill the tree and it provides fruit eternally forever. Yeah. Well, it just means that those are used as some symbols of, of kind of paradisical uh, prosperity and paradisical foods. Yes? Um, I was under the impression that the almonds actually represented when Aaron's rod sprouted almonds. Yes, absolutely. But, but the, the point of that, too, is he has this rod that you've chopped off a tree and essentially you've killed it, but he, it keeps sprouting, so it is, it is living even though it's been chopped off a tree. And, and then, yes, but, but it's, you know, the fruit, the nuts of that tree, nuts and fruit I'm equating, but yeah, that's right. And also, the groves are actually represented someplace in the Bible as the worshippers of the groves who are... Yes, yes, that's, that's right. That's why I associated, I, I didn't explain that, but... But the groves are, this term Asherah is translated as groves, and it is a Canaanite thing that is worshipped in the temple as well. Uh, the, the Israelites were not to worship the trees, right? Okay, but the Canaanites do. And so it is an apostate practice that gets on in the temple. But, but it is still the, the sacred tree symbol. Do you see what I mean? Uh, it's, it's different, What's the, what it means and what you, how you, whether you worship it or not, you can't worship trees, you can't worship rocks, you can only worship the Lord if you're Israelite. The Canaanites worship trees, they worship rocks, etc., etc. Uh, now, the, the, the earthly temple imitates the celestial temple, by which I mean that it is a copy of the celestial temple. The celestial temple is first. It's the original. What we do on earth is try to imitate that. And, and this is essentially reflected in several different things in the Old Testament associated with this Hebrew word tabnit. Tabnit is translated as pattern or type or something like that. But when Moses goes up on Mount Sinai and he gives this lengthy description of the tabernacle, it's got to be so many cubits and has to have this type of uh, cloth in it and so forth, he go goes through all these details, but he says, it says explicitly that he sees the tabnit. Now it's translated as pattern. And here's the passages where it's mentioned. So Moses goes up on Sinai, he, he meets with God, and he, he writes, you know, he gets this text of how to build the tabernacle, but it says explicitly that it is, he has seen something that is the tabnit. It's the pattern for what he's going, supposed to make. So when he ascends to Sinai, he sees a tabernacle up there. there. There's one there that he can see, and then he writes down, okay, it's so many cubits, and then you go down and make a copy of it down on earth. Does that make sense? That, that's how it's being described in these passages. Likewise, God, God in, uh, for building Solomon's temple in 1 Chronicles 28.19, God is said, is said to have written a pattern. He writes a tabnit for David. So God himself gives the instructions of how the temple is supposed to be. Now, Solomon builds it. David is not allowed to build the temple because of his blood on his hands. He's a man of blood and war. But uh, Solomon does build it. And... Uh, but it's based on the tabnit or the pattern which God revealed to David. Okay? So, so although it's not real explicit, it's, it's pretty implicit there that you've got these, uh, this celestial pattern or celestial temple. It's much more explicit in the book of Hebrews and the book of Revelation where they talk about the heavenly temple in some detail. And I've listed the passages there. You can go take a look at those if you want for yourself. So it's important to note then that the, the temple is the imitation of the real temple where God dwells permanently in the heavens. 
Now, the temple also creates cosmic order. That is to say, uh, there, there are two ancient concepts in, in the dualism of, a, of ancient uh, uh, thought. There's order and chaos. Order is a place where life can flourish and humans can live and, and uh, there can be prosperity and, and uh, peace and so forth. Chaos is where there's death, war, destruction, uh, etc. God wants to create order. Satan is the god of chaos. You know, he, he creates chaos, destruction, bloodshed, st stealing, all these different things. The temple is the source of that order, and it comes in a number of different ways. First of all, it, it provides life by having the waters of life flow from the temple and creates fertility. We talked about these rivers, this water that flows from the temple, right? And from Eden. The temple is a place where God dwells, and so evil can't go in there. And the cherubim are the guardian figures that keep uh, evil out. And the casting out of evil out of the temple precincts is symbolized by what in the Old Testament? By the atonement, the, the scapegoat uh, in the Day of Atonement. The scapegoat is cast out. The sins of Israel are put on it, and all the evil is kicked out of the temple. It goes out in the wilderness. Uh, but it, so it is the source of natural order, but it is also a source of uh, social order, which comes through the law that is given by God. Now we we translate the Hebrew term Torah as law, which is a perfectly good translation. But I think a better translation would be order. This is the order of God, the Torah, the law. Okay, so God reveals His will in a place called the Debir, which means word or thing in Hebrew. It's translated as oracle in the King James. It's the place of the word. The Debir is okay. So that is where God reveals His will, His law, and then that law is taken and implemented, creating social order, just as God's power creates natural order. And notice the difference between human beings and animals is that animals always obey the natural order. Human beings do not. They can rebel against the, the order. Okay, so, so that's an interesting distinction as well. But the temple then creates uh, cosmic order. It also binds heaven and earth, which means to say it's the, it's the link or the gateway or the portal which allows us to pass between heaven and earthly things. The earthly rituals, for example, there's a whole bunch of rituals that they're supposed to do in the Hebrew temple. Those rituals are performed uh, based on the heavens and the stars and stuff that they see in the moon and so forth, and it is imitating then the ritual order that is performed in heaven. If you, there's a, if you read in the Dead Sea Scrolls, there's a document called the Song of the Sabbath Sacrifice, in which they talk about how the angels are performing Sabbath sacrificial rituals in heaven while the people are doing it on earth, and they're singing songs at the same time. So, so the, the humans are singing a song, praising the Lord. The angels are singing exactly the same song at exactly the same time. So they're performing the ritual simultaneously, priests and angels together. Uh, and as I mentioned, priests in the earthly temple fulfill the role that the angels do in heaven. Notice when you see an angel, what, what type of clothing do they wear? They're white, white robes, right? It's always white robes. Well, once, once there's one who wears a red robe, but that's because he's been fighting and he's st stained with blood and so forth. But they're almost always described as, as white. And priests also wear white robes, and then they're imitating each other. They're imitating the, the clothing of the angels when they do that. Now, another thing that the temple has for us is what we call a microcosm. This word means a small cosmos. Cosmos means, in Greek, cosmos actually means order. It doesn't mean world. We've, it's come to mean the whole universe. So now when we talk about cosmos in modern astrophysics, we mean you know, the whole universe. Anciently, it just meant the, the, um, the world is you know, our world that we live in. Notice the term cosmetics, you know, that you put on makeup or something as cosmetics, derives from this Greek term. It means ordering your face, right? making your face a cosmos, or ordered, as opposed to what it usually is, which is chaos, right? <laughs> so, what this means, cosmos then means a, a world, and a micro means a small. So, microcosmos means a small model a, of the world, or the universe. 
And the temple is, it, it fulfills that function. That is to say, each part of the temple was kind of create, uh, equated with a different aspect of the world. Now, it's, it's a symbolic map. It's a spiritual map of holiness uh, symbolizing the cosmic order. It's not a map as we understand it. We take, use maps as geographical things telling us distance and elevation and stuff. But you can, in fact, make a map that shows you population or what rainfall or all sorts of other things, right? Anciently, maps represented spiritual reality, not some type of geographical thing. Okay, And the, there are four elements uh, that we mentioned, the earth, air, fire, and water. These are the four ancient elements, or we would call states of matter. And all of these elements are collected together and, and are reflected in the temple. The earth is the stones, the air is the incense and the smoke coming up from the uh, uh, altar. The fire is, is on the altar and it is the source of light in the temple and so forth. And then you have water reflected in what's called the bronze sea or the brazen sea in King James Bible. Sea means, you know, ocean, right? And it, it, these are, this is a big basin. I mean, it was huge. We, we know about what it was like from our uh, baptisms for the dead fonts, which are modeled on this. So anyway, you'll often see, for example, that the temple, when Solomon builds his temple, he collects materials from all over the world. He gets gemstones from the south and wood from uh, Lebanon and stuff. He's taking pieces of the whole world and putting them together to make his temple. Another characteristic of temple is purity. At a very basic level, this is just that God doesn't like you tramping uh, manure into his house, and he wants it to be clean. So God is kind of a celestial housewife, and she doesn't want the kids tracking mud in, right? So, so there is this basic sense of keep the house clean. But it certainly transcends that, that basic idea, because the purity is, is both keeping the house clean, keeping yourself physically clean, and then keeping yourself spiritually and morally clean. Now, to enter the temple, you had to do a ritual washing. It, it is an immersion in a pool called a mikvah in Hebrew. A mikvah, what, these were big basins or pools, and the people would go down, immerse themselves, come back out, and then go to the temple. And if you, when we look at Herod's temple, we have uh, a dozen or so mikvot, these mikvah places, um, surrounding the temple, where the people would go in and, and immerse themselves. Uh, in fact, uh, one time... I went to uh, the tomb of um, Isaac Luria in, in uh, Safat. He was a 16th century mystical rabbi. And he has a tomb there, but he also has a mikvah, where every, if you go to that mikvah and immerse yourself, all your sins are forgiven. That's the Jewish tradition. So I said, I better do this. So I went in there, and uh, me and a bunch of naked, uh, hardy D Jews, we were in there immersing ourselves in this pool and kind of splashing around. And, you know, and they still do it. They do it in preparations for Sabbath and lots of other things. But in the old days, you would do it before you entered the temple. You'd do a, a ritual immersion. So I think I'm the only high priest that has, has done a mikvah ritual uh, since the 70 AD when the temple was destroyed. I don't know. Uh, anyway, this is essentially a core concept. Not uniquely, but it is a core element of baptism. Baptism is a purity ritual that you purify yourself, right? And, and it prepares you to enter into a covenant with the Lord. You enter into the presence of the Lord through baptism. Now, there's more to baptism than that, but that's a key element. Yes? Um, in the early days of our church, they used to do uh, multiple baptisms. It's symbolic. Yes, that's, that's right. Uh, you could be baptized... When all the saints came to Utah, they did, everybody got rebaptized, And it wasn't to become a member of the church, but a rededication, re-covenant, re-purification. Right. It's also moral purity. This is a key concept. The purity is not just physical, but it's moral. And this passage is very important in the Psalms that, that reflects this whole purity idea. It's Psalm 24, 3-4, and it says, Who shall ascend to the house of the Lord? Who shall enter his holy place? That is the temple, right? Ascend to the... Uh, house in the temple. He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. The clean hands represents the physical purification. You do the mikvah you, mikvah, you purify yourself. And then pure heart means the inner spiritual purification. So there's an outer physical purification as well as an inner uh, spiritual purification required. You had everything that entered the temple had to be pure. All right? And in fact, there were levels of purity. Uh, Israelites could come into one area, then only the priests could go to another area, then only the, uh, the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies. So, so, you know, there were 
more and more uh, levels of purity that was involved there. Temples are also a place of perpetual light, which means essentially there's always light burning in the temple. This is described in these passages from Exodus and Leviticus, but basically the two sources of light were the menorah, which had to be constantly burning, and one of the things the priests did every day was they'd go in and they'd clean out and, and uh, re-supply uh, oil for the menorah had these seven branches on it, seven lamps on these seven branches. And then there was also a fire burning on the incense altar. So there was always light in the temple. It's a place of perpetual light. And that light, of course, symbolizes the light of God. Uh, there's lots of music at the temple. This is a coin, a silver coin from the, one of the Jewish revolts against the Romans, in which they put a lyre to symbolize the temple. This is a, you know, a, like a harp, right? A lyre. And uh, Everywhere you read about the temple, you'll read about the, uh, the singing of hymns uh, and the reciting of psalms in the temple. Many of the psalms are temple hymns. Now, not all of them are. You've kind of got to study them and figure out which ones are, but a lot of them are. And we know that on each day a different hymn was sung, and these are the psalms associated with the different days. So it's a place of music. And music is sacred. It's, it's music for God. It's not music for entertainment. It's not an MP3, right? Also dancing. We tend to think of dancing today as a kind of spasmodic uh, human jerking around in time in, uh, in sync with uh, disgusting cacophonic music in a vain attempt to impress members of the opposite sex, right? Isn't that how you define dancing in modern terms? No? <laughs> anyway, uh, it's, it's funny. Humans have an in instinct to dance. My little uh, grandkids, I, I'm doing all sorts of uh, experiments on my grandkids. Uh, they're probably going to be warped. But, but one of the experiments, I, did, I did, wouldn't dare do it on my kids, but I can do it on my grandkids. Um, so we practice clapping, right? It's a very instinctive thing that, that little kids can clap before they can do almost anything else. Right, and I we, we play music, and my little one-year-old grandkid, they'll just start bouncing like this. They'll, I mean, it's an instinct to have this rhythm, this sense of rhythm, uh, and you know, it's a universal human thing. That music is poetry. You you say words to music. You have music, but you also do ritual gestures or dance associated with music. And dance is was a temple ritual. In 2 Samuel 5.5, 5, this is most clearly described, where David dances before the Lord as they bring the Ark of the Covenant in. And, and uh, you know, that's just one example. But dance is, is reflect. It's not a lot reflected in the Old Testament. But there's hints of it that it was going on. But if you go to, for example, India or Southeast Asia today, the, uh, the traditions of temple dance are preserved. I've seen some of these that are performed. They still will do the old dances that they did 1,000 or 1,500 years ago. And the dances are not just, uh, you know, gesture in time to music. They are, in fact, are storytelling. The, the dance tells something. It's more of a pantomime, we would call it. So dance and pantomime are intimately connected together. And it's another way to symbolically and ritually uh, represent sa sacred things. So dance means something quite different nowadays, but in, uh, you know, uh, in the, nowadays we do dancing with the stars. In the old days, we do dancing with the gods. That is to say, it was a sacred ritual that you interacted with God in that way. There's also all sorts of ritual gestures that are involved in the temple. And this one, for example, describes raising of the hands. Ancient people prayed with their hands upraised. It's, it's, once you know that they do that, you can s read about raising, I lifted my hands to the Lord. I mean, this is all ritual gestures of, of how you pray. There's lots of other ones as well. The sacred hand clasp is one we'll talk about. So there's ritual gestures going on in the temple. That is, acts that you do as, you, for example, bow, bowing down, raising your hands, hand clasp, lots of different things that you might do in the temple as ritual gestures. Now, if you want some more information about this type of stuff, you should take a look at these books. Uh, we've got the Solomon's Temple book that has a lot of it, but th this is kind of a good introduction to the whole idea. And these are some uh, LDS-related books that uh, look into some of these.